four, three, two, and one. This is the last episode of the Art of Move for December 2021, and it is a very special episode. Uh, in 2021, which is cool, we've done 21 episodes in 2021, starting in October. We've had over 850 plays in over 30 different countries. So anyone who's been listening since the beginning of the Art of Move podcast, thank you sincerely. Today we have a really cool guest, someone who's influenced me a lot on my fitness journey. We have Keegan Smith, one of the co-founders of APG for Coaches. Um, Keegan has inspired me to do so many different things on my fitness journey, including trying the carnivore diet, doing both end and close range work. He has inspired me to get into cryptocurrency and NFTs more recently. He's one of the more interesting, innovative coaches that I've had the opportunity to learn from. So I'm very, very excited to have him on. Starter of three seven figure businesses and just in general, really, really cool dude to talk to. So Keegan, thank you so much for joining us today. Where are you joining us from geographically today? I'm in uh, Montenegro, a little village near uh, Budvar. Cool. And we are in uh, the Canadian Rockies. So we're in Banff and Canmore, Alberta, respectively, right in the, right in the middle of the, the mountains in, in Alberta, Canada. Canada. So we're cool. doing that. Uh, that's, that's one of my favorite things about No Filter. For anyone who's joining live on No Filter, uh, you can ask Egan, Will, or I questions. I'm joined with Dr. William Raybar. My name is Anthony Manuel. Dr. Will is a chiropractor and just in general, incredibly intelligent dude when it comes to the body. If you've been listening to these episodes before, then you know that this is a very biomechanics heavy movement and performance heavy podcast. And I'm really excited to talk to Keegan about uh, tissue training and and some of the ATG methods uh, and how we can kind of learn from each other in this conversation. So uh, Will, I know you've listened to a lot of Keegan's podcasts recently. What are some of the things that have stood out that you wanted to ask him about? Uh, well, I mean, a lot, but uh, first off, I'd just like to thank you for coming on. It's great. Uh, how does one uh, decide to go to Montenegro? Just right off the start. Uh, read, read Kurt, want to get some animals out of country. Oh, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Uh, I've actually been there, and it's a beautiful spot, so it's that's why I asked. Yeah. I, had, I had some bunch of people recommended it, and we were in the market for a country, so... Yeah. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. Okay. So um, I understand you're a rugby coach and uh, you came up along those lines. Uh, I understood you were a hockey player at one point as well. Could you give us a little bit of a history of your own training and uh, how you came to be where you're at now? Yeah. So my father is a rugby coach, rugby league coach, and he's reasonably well known in Australian sport. He, he worked in, like in the equivalent of the NFL for like 30 years. Um, <clears throat> So I grew up around that environment, around big rugby guys. And I was a bit of a runt and I, I kind of liked, I liked, I played all sports, but um, it wasn't until I played hockey that I actually kind of experienced some level of success. So I, I think it just stuck because I was able to make, you know, representative teams and kind of, for whatever reason, um, I stuck with hockey and I wanted to go to the Olympics for hockey. Australia wins gold in the Olympics for hockey sometimes. And, and that was really uh, like the, the vision and the dream. That was the only thing that I could sort of think, well, yeah, that'd be cool if I did that when I grow up. So I think I was about 12 and I presented to the class about, you know, what I'm going to do when I grow up. And, and that was kind of the vision, go and play in Holland, which, you know, was sort of one of the powerhouses of hockey. And um, I'm talking about field hockey, which is not the hockey that you might play in Canada. But um, yeah, there's not much ice hockey in Australia. And, um, yeah, anyway, it's, it's a minority sport in Australia as, as it is, but it's, it's kind of one of those Commonwealth games that got exported around and um, stuck in some places and not in others. But uh, yeah, so I was playing that. I got really obsessive with it. Uh, it's quite a lopsided sport and I, I developed a bunch of injuries. I think I had my first overuse injury at about 10 years old. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I sort of battled through shin splints and stress fractures and, and ankle surgery and knee tendonitis and all that stuff all through my career. I always, um, towards the end at least, I, I really worked a lot harder than other players and that kind of helped me to start making some state teams and I was kind of getting close to playing um, national level to, to sort of get to that Olympic dream. But uh, yeah, a bunch of injuries and things got in the way. Um, because I was quite slow, and my, my father, you know, being someone who's, who was in the world of sports and working with professional, you know, he, he worked with some of the first professional athletes in Australia and had a professional strength and conditioning coaches and you know, some really smart guys. He sort of told me, look, you know, 
you're, you're never going to be fast. If you're not fast, you're never going to be fast, but at least you can have good endurance. And, and when I was like 15, that kind of shattered me because I wasn't making the teams because I was too slow. Um, but I started strength training anyway, and I ended up being one of the fastest guys and having, you know, one of the best uh, beep tests and, 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 and 40 meter times and that sort of thing as well. Um, and I think it was down to strength training. So, yeah, I really, I loved strength training. I think I also had that thing that most guys have, like I was the skinniest out of most of my friends. They, they were mostly like rugby players and, and everyone was kind of 10, 15 kilos heavier than me. And I didn't really like that. It's pretty tough as a young guy um, to kind of yeah feel like you're behind the pack or you're bottom of the pecking order, you know, when you start to be interested in girls and things like that. So um, I think I fell in love with weight training for those kind of two reasons, you know, to, to be better at sports, be faster, and also just to, uh, you know, self-esteem and those sorts of things. Um, so, yeah, that was that was kind of the journey, like overcoming injuries, getting more, more athletic and, and trying to put on some some mass. I had a really tough time adding mass. Uh, I think I finished high school at like 65 kilos, even though I'd been training for a couple of years um, at the same height I am now. And then you know, I finished uni at about 74 kilos at the end of university. And I really just wanted to be like at least 80 kilos. And I started working with professional rugby players where the average weight was, at that time was probably about 95 kilos, about 100 kilos now. Um, so I was always the small guy in the environment. And um, yeah, I guess that kept me hungry for learning about nutrition and strength training and, and all those things. So um, yeah, I did some work experience working in professional rugby uh, while I was going through university and uh, didn't really know where that was going. Ended up working as an assistant with a rugby team in London for a year, which was really cool. So I ended up running the, the strength side of things there where I wasn't hired to do that, but fell into it and it was great fun. And then I backpacked for like six years and kind of discovered what was going on in the world from, from a different perspective and can, you know, kind of hit rock bottom at the end of that of like, who am I, what am I doing? Um, and, and, and fell back into working rugby again. I worked for four more years in rugby uh, running programs and my teams did well. And then, I left that to uh, to work in, in coaching coaches and uh, kind of mentoring that sort of thing, and I've been doing that uh, for the last sort of seven or eight years. So yeah, that's that's kind of the story up to now. That's awesome. So um, you were mentioning you started training when you were about fifteen. When did you? And and I assume you were training traditionally, you know, bodybuilding, powerlifting. Uh, that's my assumption, right? When did you turn more into ATG style? Uh, you know, length tension. When did that switch happen for you? Yeah, I mean, I experimented with with everything, really. My brother started doing weights for rugby, and he had, like, a basic setup maybe when I was 13 or 14, and that's probably when I started playing with it. Um, but I got programs off, you know, the coaches from the rugby teams, and uh, I was doing split squats and things like that, like Bulgarian split squats. And it wasn't, it wasn't like traditional bodybuilding, powerlifting so much, um, but I had a lot of good coaches kind of introduce me to different movements. Um, and I was pretty big into reading, so I read all the, you know, Mike, Mike Boyle and uh, Dan John and Charles Poliquin and Ian King and um, Finding Teen Nation, I think, in like 2004 or five was, was huge, and I just read everything, and uh, I tried a lot of the programs, but my, I, I just, I wasn't, a, I, I didn't adapt very well. I think I had, looking back, like I had, a, I had gut issues, and I think that that was like a big factor in not adapting to training, like I'm sure you understand the, the holistic perspective on that, but I had underlying immune system issues that I think were making it, wow, it's such a hard gainer. My digestive system didn't work and my, my immune system was overworked, so I didn't have the ability to, to recover like other people. Um, and so, yeah, I was always looking for the solution. And um, yeah, I went into Poliquin stuff when I was sort of back in that second round of coaching, I went and did his PICP one and two. I was really big into Polchak. I think I read How to Eat, Move and Be Healthy when I was, um, you know, like when it first came out, like 2000, uh, 2000, 2001, two, somewhere around that. Like I, I read it, but it was just so different from where I was at at that point. And I, I was doing exercise science at university, but it was like so different that I, I don't think I was able to get that much out of it. Um, but I did end up going back to that Weston A. Price kind of philosophy and, and, and you know, still that, that's, that system has impacted me. But um, I knew that Charles's stuff was amazing, but it w I, I went with more of a West Side approach uh, in 2013, 14. Like the most success I had in rugby was really with like a very physics based, like how do we produce more force than these other guys? Um, and kind of brutalized, um, and that that was 
what worked with the group that I was with, and there were a number of factors of why that was successful. Um, I was just still searching for like, why does my everything hurt? Why do I always get tendonitis? Um, you know, why am I more prone to this? And then, you know, what what is the way to overcome it? Like I was still searching for that in 2017, 18, and I was starting to get it that Charles had done something different with his, with his training, with his, like his arms program with like, um, the, the way the different movements were targeting different parts of the, of the strength curve. And, um, I was kind of getting the idea and it wasn't until like, I saw what Ben had done for the knees I was like, yeah, this is it. Like, this is, this is the thing that I've been looking for for the last 20 years. Like, this is the thing that the world of strength needs to know that it doesn't know. Um, and yeah, so it, it's, it's pretty recently that, you know, I, started to to train in that way like i i played around with like gymnastics training i went to an Edo portal event in 2013 um i interned with him in in thailand and went to a number of his other events and you know he he has a lot of the principles and i think i don't know whether he understands it in the same way but like he, he definitely has stuff within his program i did coach summer stuff like a lot of it kind of overlaps but there was just no like unifying kind of theory to to put it in a framework where i knew how to program with it and um like use it with dexterity across any joint across any situation like that's really what clicked for me um when i started to have conversations with ben and look at also the sequencing is like a huge part so understanding short and long range and then like the sequencing of that i think is to me that's the biggest the most important thing that i've learned in strength training um is is, is that kind of theory so um, yeah, it came together when I saw Ben and I sort of said to him, hey, everybody needs to know this. He had like 50 online clients at the time. And I said, like, everybody needs to know this. Like, you've got something massive here. People don't get this. Um, you need to get it out to the world. And um, yeah, he's, uh, he's done that to an extent that nobody could have predicted at that time. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of the journey. Cool. So for, for the listeners who might not be familiar with Ben Patrick or the ATG system, you know, I am because I was, you know, I was part of ATG for uh, three months, six, if you count my time when I was working with Lucas Aaron, when it was real movement. And then, um, for those who are just listening now, how would you explain long range versus short range training and how you sequence things and what the ultimate goal of that is and how it differentiates from maybe the focus of just conventional strength and conditioning work? Yeah. So I, to me, this is like the, this is the, one of the million dollar questions. Um, this is the thing that is really making a huge difference for everyone from grandmas to professional athletes. Short range movements are when the, there's a lot of tension when there isn't a stretch on, on the fascia. Um, so if I'm leaning forwards into an incline bench and I'm doing bicep curls there, like spider curls, then there's no stretch on the tissue when I'm working quite hard in the movement. So it's a very muscle dominant movement and it's not going to cause bicep tendonitis or flare up bicep tendonitis to the same extent as if I lay back on the bench and I have my arms back behind me, and everything's under stretch and tension there. And I, I curl from that position. You'll find if you use that, or if you lay back flat on the bench, I've had professional athletes, you know, who can curl 20, 25 kilos for, for reps, like comfortably, you lay them back up flat on the bench or on the incline bench. And like with five kilos, they're in, in extreme, like wincing. Um, so that tells you the story of like, Oh, there's something here that really matters about how much passive tension or fascial tension is on the tendon at the time when we use the muscle. And so all we do is sequence from short to long and great things happen. People, people realize, oh, like that tricep tendonitis that's been bothering me for the last five years when I bench press, it's gone. It's gone in three sessions. Like it's, it happens over and over again, um, quicker than people would, would realize and, and can, can imagine. Um, so starting with like short range and it can be concentric dominant movements, um, super high reps, getting like a lot of blood flow and pump into the area. And you'll see this pop up like that kind of happens with the um, flossing stuff that Kelly Starrett made really popular. Um, you know, Louis Simmons has been using sleds for a long time. He used them also before before sessions. Um, you, you know, I've heard about him personally using them before sessions. Um, so it's not necessarily a new, even um, CT Fletcher's stuff, you know, he, he, they often start with like the 100 reps of like changing from lightweight to heavier weight to lightweight again, and just getting a big pump into the area so that that joint and functions well. Now, it, it, it sounds really intuitive and it sounds like how's that even a big deal, but 
<laughs> when you've grown up in a system where you're told the A series needs to be the big movements and you need to go into it, like you can do some movement prep, but then you go into your A series and the A series needs to be big bang for your buck. That's that philosophy is, is causing all sorts of, all sorts of challenges. So um, yeah, if you can start with the short range movements and then progress to, to long range. So I gave that example with the biceps. Another example would be with the triceps. You can start with like barbell tricep kickbacks or even just push downs. Like it doesn't have to be extreme short range. The, the, the tricep uh, kickback is, is a shorter range because you're getting closer to cramping your, your triceps and it getting into the shortest position it can be in. But even just push, you know, push downs can be okay if you don't have too much of an issue there. Um, but then before you go into French presses, you know, because so many people can't do French presses because of, it, it bothers their elbows. Um, sometimes it bothers shoulders and things as well, but that's a separate issue. But um, yeah, that sequencing is just absolutely, um, it just, it, it's, it, it makes a big difference. And especially a lot of our guys now train older people as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the magic of short and long and, and the sequencing. So can we unpack that a little bit? Let's say a short range, are you talking more concentric muscle movement and then long range is more for tendons and fascia? Is that how you would separate it? Or is it, could you expand yep. on that a little bit? Yep, yep, yep. So you, yeah, you can definitely call them like concentric dominant movements in the short range and eccentric dominant movements in the longer range. Um, you don't tend to do like slow eccentrics on the concent on the on the short range movements because they're not as effective because almost by definition, like when you're using the eccentrics, you, you're going into the, the fascia and that's why you use those kind of slow uh, tempo eccentrics to, to really like, um, yeah, tear, tear the muscle up and cause more damage. So you can categorize the short range movements as concentric dominant, they're neurally dominant, so they're great for rewiring. Like if you've injured an area, like to connect the brain back to that area, the short range, they're neur neurally dominant, they're great for high repetitions. Um, and when you when you do that first, before you go into the longer range stuff, which causes more remodeling, uh, it's more connective tissue dominant, we tend to do lower total reps, um, you don't do it as often, it causes a lot more inflammation. So if someone has a lot of systemic inflammation, you don't want to jump into tons of long range work and you don't want to do that day in, day out. Whereas sleds, we can do every day because they're short range, concentric dominant. Uh, for the knees, at least, we can do them every day. If there's an issue at the Achilles, then the sled push can be more of a long range and then you have to, so it's, it's joint by joint how you consider it. But um, yeah, that's, that's sort of the breakdown of like, do I want to cause inflammation? Do I want to cause um, significant remodeling here? Do I need more length um, in this area? You know, like, uh, the best example of gaining length would be with something like that inclined bicep um, or, or, or lying bicep curl or something like the, the Nordic or the RDL. You know, you can get really fast gains. Like we have guys saying, I've never touched my toes. Like I haven't touched my toes in 20 years within two or three sets of, of Nordics, especially if you go like slant board, um, Zercher, then within two or three sets, you have guys like touching their toes or sometimes palms on the floor. And now it depends how strong that fascial link is of how, you know, if, if they're really strong, then you don't have to be as cautious about it. Um, and a little bit of weight can, can go a long way. If you do that with grandma, then yeah, you, you, you know, you can, you can flare up that fascial stuff and then it, it, that can take a couple of weeks to settle down. Like you don't want to flare up like lumbar fascia. Um, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you can, you can share more about that, but you can get really rapid, um, learning of new positions i don't you know there will be remodeling of the tissue but it's not remodeling really that's happening over the course of like a few minutes um, you can bring a lot of heat into the area and then you know you can access more than what was there before um that's that's kind of how how the sequencing works anything to add to that anthony no i was so so you know one of the things that you brought up is that a lot of the you know, these E-series movements, these big bang for your buck compound movements, they come with, with issues where you can get really strong in them. I've experienced this too. You know, I, I think one of the reasons, you know, I'm going into shoulder surgery in two days for a slap tear that I got doing, doing a snatch uh, under fatigue in a CrossFit workout about a year and some ago. And, you know, I think the reason for that, this was my, this was my pre ATG days, you know, I hadn't done a lot of the end range conditioning. I didn't have the the freedom in my shoulders to actually snatch properly. And, uh, 
most of my movements, I was, I was incredibly strong on these heavy compound movements in the frontal and sagittal planes, but I didn't have that, that shoulder range. Right. And so when you, when you're saying that there's these guys that can, you know, they can bicep curl tons of weight, but give them, you know, five kilos to do that end range on a bench and they're, they're cringing. Right. What do you think is the physiological cause? How does the body get conditioned if you're doing this, you know, this heavy, you know, you know, frontal sagittal plane work, these, these heavy compound movements, what physiologically happens that makes people limited in these ranges? My understanding is like, we're just, we're wearing like a smart suit. So if you think like there's like a wetsuit on the inside and that suit is programmed to not let us tear ourselves to bits. So it flashes the warning on when we go to a place that we're not meant to go to. And it's also sensitive to tension and it's sensitive um, to load and all those things. And and when the warning light flashes on, it just kind of switches off the nervous system. It's got like a kill switch on it. So you can't just break yourself. Otherwise everyone would tear themselves to shreds at a powerlifting competition or a weightlifting competition. Like you, you train yourself to be able to go further towards your limit, but still there's probably like a big safety zone, comfort zone there. Um, that's kind of some of the work of like Charlie Francis of like using the EMS, electric muscle stimulation, stimulation. Um, some of the research around like the use of the electric chair, I think is interesting where with enough voltage, people will literally snap their own bones, um, break their own teeth. So the force capability is probably there for us to do a lot more than we can actually do. And my understanding is also that with range is, is there's also some of that too. Um, I've heard, I haven't, you know, experienced for myself, but they say when people are in a coma, et cetera, um, that they can access a lot, lot more range. Um, so you're kind of just switching off that smart sensor to an extent to, to give new range. Uh, so I think when we strength train into those areas versus stretching, we teach the body that it's safe and by going into the range and then going out of that range, whether it's with pulses or with kind of like full range, doesn't really matter. But I think like easing on and taking off seems to be more effective than just holding in those positions uh, when you're trying to teach the body, hey, it's fine here, like we're strong, it's all good. Um, but if you really just say like F you to the body and to that system and you just put more load and more speed, then yeah, you'll, you'll flare things up and, and people sometimes don't take range of strength seriously and they treat it like uh, it's just stretching, like no big deal. And you, you can definitely, you know, aggravate muscles and, 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 and joints and, and cause things to, uh, to flare up that can take quite a while to, to settle down. The cool thing is with having the short range work, things tend to settle down much faster. Like if people do get overly excited with the Jefferson curls and, and things like that, doing short range hamstring work has turned it into like a, you know, a couple of week thing versus like, oh yeah, like three years ago, I worked too hard on my pancake and I still have this hamstring insertion issue, which is what I was hearing all the time in the gymnastic strength community back in, you know, 2013, 14, 15, people would be like, yeah, I worked hard on my pancake and now I don't feel like I can stretch that at all because so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like the, the more we understand and have like a framework of thinking then it's like we can solve problems as they arise with more logic and, um, not be so fearful. And I think it's also like you become less fearful of plyometrics as well as being less fearful of like hard stretching. Um, if you have tools to be able to know that you can recover things faster. Like I deliberately avoided plyometrics with my rugby guys because I just didn't want them to have tendonitis that they couldn't, they wouldn't get rid of for the next 10 years of their career. And maybe the guy that gave it to them, um, where now I would, I would definitely give them more of that kind of work because I know that it's just, it's a continuum and you can, you can heal that stuff very quickly if you, if you know what you're doing and you know what to avoid. Um, so yeah, covered a few things there, but, um, you can, you can definitely learn the positions. And if you think of it as that in that logic, I haven't met anyone who can't make huge game gains in range. Like people have limiting beliefs about this stuff. Like I'm just not flexible. So, no, you just never gave your body a chance to learn. Yeah, that's that's pretty much my experience as well. And going back to the um, the safety aspect of the fascial suit, uh, when people get injured, I'm a chiropractor. I've worked with you know injured people all day. When someone gets injured, I always get them to go back into the safety zone where their body doesn't hurt then slowly introduce them back into movements that move into 
you know, 5% before the pain zone, right? So that their body can, um, you know, get those inputs into the brain, the spinal cord. Now, I used to use the FRC principles um, maybe a year ago where I would go slow into the range, think more capsule. However, how would you uh, use the ATG system in that with what I've described? Yeah, I mean, that that's intuitive. Like what you're using there intuitively, like that makes tons of sense to me. And there's so many smart people that I've never heard of that have worked out all sorts of things that, that you know, that I haven't seen. Um, but yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. Um, the FRC, I, I haven't done the courses. A lot of guys that I've worked with have, and I've, I've seen a lot of it. Um, I personally just didn't really have the patience for it. Um, and coming from like the rugby background, like guys are strong and they're muscle bound. And it's like, I know some of the FRC guys are jacked, but I, I, I have the feeling that it's going to take a, a lot of work. Like I've seen people be in that system for six months or 12 months and, and still be like in a position where, you know, they're, they're still pretty tight, like especially muscular guys. Um, and maybe they just didn't do it right. Like, I don't, I don't know, like I'm not putting the system down. Um, um, my experience is just with the, the loaded stuff where I think we're getting like a bit of a double bang for the buck where we're strengthening the tendons and structures and, and things so that they're going to be more bulletproof at high speed um, or under high tension. Like we're getting more of that at the same time as, as learning those positions. Um, it just ma it's, it's more, it makes more sense to me to focus on um, – Lengthening the like like stretching the muscle like stretching the antagonist bef before doing that sort of agonist work like that that's worked really well for me so like for example like doing the slant board Nordics and then doing my like my V sit work like I've I've worked hard to get like trying to get the shins on the face on a on a V sit I haven't got there but I can get like relatively close to it but I'll get into it by you know doing the the Zercher Jefferson all that kind of work or single leg versions of that. Um, before I, I try and hit those kind of shorter range positions. So I don't know if that sort of makes sense or overlaps with what you're, what you're thinking there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think with my experience with uh, like FRC and doing it, it takes a lot of time. Like I can be doing my hips for an hour, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> um, with, I haven't really done ATG myself, but you know, looking into it quite a bit, I, it seems to make more intuitive sense to me how you guys lay it out and, uh, it seems to be less, you know, I could do other things and do ATG and I won't spend an hour just doing my hips, right? So that seems to be more along the lines of where I would want to go with that. Um, I still don't know exactly how to integrate it into the office, into, uh, you know, a scenario where I told you, you know, I'm getting someone to move into that 5% before they get into pain type scenario. I would assume you just progressively, let's say I'm going to give you an example, uh, knee tendonitis, uh, patellar tendonitis. If I was to get somebody to do that on a slant board, I would go 5% before they hit that pain range and start to get them to work short move, um, concentric movements in that range to get their nervous system used to it and blood flow in that area. Is that about what you would say or how you would work with an athlete? Yeah, so you can work directly onto the slant board. It depends on how long they've had it for, how sensitive it is. Like generally we would start people with walking backwards, walking backwards on a treadmill or walking backwards, just, you know, um, a very light sled or like walking backwards up a hill or on a very slight incline. But that would be my preference of where you would go first. And then, um, yeah, the, the slant board uh, step ups or the Patrick, you know, the Patrick step ups. Uh, like a flat foot on a step, but you're letting the knee go forward. Patrick, Patrick variation is kind of like the first variation. Um, yeah, if you do that sort of work, and yeah, always avoid, like never going into the place where, where there's any pain um, and, and just gradually wanting to expand that zone. So you do that sort of stuff first, and then you would find like a stretch that they feel okay with as well. So often for us, that's, that'd be the catch stretch. So that kind of gives you like almost long range work with a very, very light load. Like I think of the couch stretch as being like a very light version of like the Jefferson curl for the quad. Um, so we would also do like a reverse Nordic. Like if I was working with a professional athlete, it depends how, how strong the tendonitis is. 
but I really like the reverse Nordic with the feet elevated. I, do you know what the reverse reverse Nordic um, natural knee extension is the way other people call it? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure. Is that is that not an eccentric Nordic or are we talking about something completely different? It's like say you're like kneeling, or you're sitting on your feet. So you kneel and then imagine sitting on your feet and then go back and t like lay down and touch the shoulders on the ground. Gotcha. Um, but if you elevate the feet, it's nowhere near as aggressive. Um, and you can kind of like get the quad stretch and then gradually be able to lean back more into it to get that full fascial, like anterior chain fascial stretch and turn it into a bit more like rectus, fem rectus, uh, yeah, rectus femoris and psoas and, and that sort of thing. Um, so that would be, that would be kind of how I would um, look at it. And then obviously, yeah, like you, you know, you guys would look at it in a holistic way of, you know, what's going on with the feet, what's going on with the, the shins, like often the tibialis anterior is really weak. And that means that the, the tendons, like the, the whole knee joint kind of cops it a lot more because you're not able to shock absorb um, as well from the ground. So like if the feet are good, if we get working on the feet, we're working on the tibs and we're doing that work to get a lot of blood flow in the area with the sled and then maybe some step ups and then get some time in that lengthened position. Cause oftentimes, yeah, that the calf stretch would be just horrendous. Um, but if you, I find like that kneeling cut type version is, I, I personally really like it because you can just sit there. You don't, it doesn't feel like you're stretching. Like it's, it's not as, um, so you can play on your phone or whatever. Like the, the usability of this stuff makes a difference. And yeah, like if FRC gets you a phenomenal result in, you know, a hundred hours of deep, deep concentrated work, but you can get a similar result in you know, five hours of work where you, you're on your phone at the same time. Like most people are just going to want that first variation. Now, if you're doing ballet or something, then you, you kind of need that FRC type thing. Like if you're martial arts or maybe, and that's probably where the system comes from. I think the background is, is in dance, right? Um, <clears throat> but in rugby, like guys don't necessarily want to be able to kick the other guy in the head. They just want to be able to, you know, sprint and, and feel really, really smooth and not tear things. Um, so like that tissue strength it, the tolerance and force tolerance is, is super important as well. Um, but the, yeah, does that make sense in terms of how we might look at the uh, patella tendon? Yeah, but I mean, I'm, all that stuff that you've, all, everything you just said makes a lot of sense, right? So Anthony, do you have anything to add to that? Or no, any questions? You don't, I, I, I had to laugh when you, when you talked about like, you, you're sitting there working on your hips for an hour using FRC. I have a friend who's a yoga instructor and she started doing some of the FRC stuff. She's like, you know, I love it. And it's, you know, it's done more for my posture in a month than, you know, two years of yoga did. But the problem is it's so fucking boring. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, this is, this is the thing. I think uh, athlete buy-in is also a really big thing. I, I futzed around with a little bit of FRC stuff. Uh, Pavel Salcelin had a great book called Super Joints. And a lot of that articulation and, and, and stuff, that was, that was like my you know, I, I noticed like, oh, you know, like Pavel was talking about some of these, these joint articulation concepts that FRC kind of gets into. Um, it, you know, same thing. I worked with, with guys who, who, uh, you know, were, were Edo Portal students that also were FRC certified and they got me doing a bunch of that stuff too. And, you know, it's, it's useful and stuff, but like, I really do think that the bang for your buck stuff is important because it, it creates more, first of all, it creates more athlete buy-in. Um, Will, you and I have talked a lot about you know, you, you can do whatever you want, but how much time do you actually want to spend on it? You know, I think FRC is, is, is a huge time investment for not a lot of tangible gains. I've, I've even, you know, I, I tried talking to certain FRC coaches and they even warned me. It's like, look, I'm, I'm going to warn you. It's, it's very boring and it's not very fun and you aren't going to see results very fast. And I'm like, well, why the fuck would I do it? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, frankly. Um, and, you know, one of my, one of my favorite things about the ATG system is, you know, when you're talking about getting these athletes doing some Jefferson curls and then being able to touch the, the, the floor with their palms in, the, in, in a matter of minutes, that immediate neurological feedback and then being able to access these ranges and then building strength from those ranges so that you can just have access to them after, you know, that was always something that, that really appealed to me. I was, uh, I was a strength coach who was always really impatient about the results that I got. I was always about, you know, what, how, can I, how can I condition my nervous system as quickly as possible to, to get faster results. And I think, um, you know, obviously what I like about ATG and what I like about your approach is that you, you kind of combine both. You're combining that, that blood flow and that, you know, and that consideration of how much inflammation you're causing 
in like systemically with also conditioning the nervous system to be able to handle and adapt. You're, you're not just, you know, I, I found that the approach was either nervous system conditioning or, or tissue conditioning. And I find that the, the you know, ATG is a, is a good milieu between the two of them. Right. So, um, when you're, when you're approaching athletics and when you're approaching the body, what what are some measures or benchmarks that you look for to consider a person athletic or durable? That's a good question. Yeah. It's quite specific. Like we're just I was just on a conversation before this with Graham Tuttle. Um, <clears throat> he's getting a lot of people being able to sprint barefoot. I think that's a pretty good measure if you can sprint bare feet. Um, without any kind of fear or without being fragile, um, you're in a pretty good position. Um, there's a lot of different metrics you could use. I think it's pretty specific to what people want to do. But, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of a few movements, like if you can do the ATG split squat, that puts you in a pretty good position in terms of hip flexors, ankle mobility, knee health. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's that's kind of a... A, a, a quite an all-encompassing, uh, you know, if you can do that and you can you can get some decent range on um, the Jefferson, you know, whether it's on the slant board or not, but if you've got that forward bend, you've got the split squat, maybe like the cross bench pullover um, or your one arm hang as well is, is a really good one for like the shoulder integrity. Um, you need a lot of connective tissue strength and, and a lot of good things to be going on. Um, to be able to support your body weight on one arm, like, like hanging and uh, any kind of balancing. I think like, you know, did amazing stuff in, in that realm of like making people think about if you can support your whole body weight on one arm, like there's something good happening in, in the shoulder. Um, so yeah, I don't know. There, there are a few measures. What, what would you guys throw up for that? Like it's a pretty, um, there's a lot of ways you could go with that. Answering that one. <laughs> there's a lot of ways, right? Um, I, you know, when I think of athleticism, or at least when we've talked about athleticism in the context of this podcast, we've thought really first principles of, you know, posture, walking, running, sprinting, throwing. I've, I've kind of explored a lot of the brachiation stuff coming from like, you know, I, I did a lot of beetle portal work too. So I think brachiation is not necessarily a first principles uh, thing, but I think having the ability to break eat is huge. It's something that I'm really, you know, I'm, I, I want to get my surgery kind of over and done with so I can start doing some, you know, hanging work again. That's the one thing I tore my bicep tendon. So being able to hang, I haven't been able to do it for almost a year. And I'm, I'm like, I'm dying to do it because it feels so good on my shoulders. Um, the ability to throw without, you know, is, is a big, big thing in terms of shoulder function for me. Um, so I think like, if I was thinking of like, First principles, fundamental movements for athleticism, it's, it's throwing, sprinting, or running. And, and I, I throw in brachiation. I know, Will, you don't necessarily think brachiation is like a first principles thing, but I, I, I still consider it pretty strongly in terms of just, you know, things that I want to be able to do. Yeah. No, it's, it's up there, right? Like, I, just, I don't think it's like the number one thing to do, but it depends on what your goals are, right? Um, if I'm looking at a natural human, how much swinging are you doing? How much handstanding are you doing? Probably not a lot. Um, and that's kind of where I, where I come from, right? On that. Uh, let's go back to a little bit more general, uh, talking about, uh, let's say tension training versus strength training. I understand from listening that you kind of separate the two. You're thinking more tension versus traditional strength. How much can you lift? How much external load do you have? versus how much tension you can create within your own body. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I, I've made a lecture about this because I think people, the, the main issue is people think, oh, like that guy's never been to the gym and he's crazy strong. So therefore strength training doesn't work or therefore I don't need to go to the gym either. Um, an example is like Ben's dunking guys, right? Like, so these guys are throwing down these massive dunks and they go to the gym and they can do Nordics already. They can do like super heavy weight on the Patrick step up. And it's like, well, they've never strength trained. Obviously strength training isn't that important because these guys have got like, you know, windmill dunks. It's like, no, 
you're just looking at it through, you know, your lens isn't in focus. You're not seeing what's actually going on here. Every time they go and dunk, they're getting an extreme stimulus of tension onto the tissues. So onto the onto the muscle, onto the connective tissue. So they've trained the, the, that, they've maximally developed the ability for those tissues to tolerate tension and to produce force. They just didn't do it in the gym, which who cares? Like no one cares whether the, it's the capacity is being built in the gym or not. You can then jump to the conclusion of, okay, yeah, nobody needs to go to the gym. Everybody just needs to train tension. The problem with that is when something goes wrong and you can't go and dunk, um, well, these guys have one leg that's amazing and one leg that's terrible. Um, what do you go and do about that? And if it hurts, the solution isn't just to dunk off the other leg. So what do you do about that? And, and ATG answers that question. Like that, that is a question that to my mind hadn't been answered. Um, you know, rugby players, they'd be like, oh, this kid's, you know, crazy strong. He's 16. He's never been in the gym. Like, look how strong he is. Like, yeah, but he's been wrestling his older brothers. He's been playing rugby league, like, you know, every chance he gets um, since he was six years old. So he's been strength training every day of his life. He just hasn't been doing it in the gym. And so the highest tension movements are going to be those ones that, you know, produce the most force, the ones that you'd be most scared of. Um, you know, getting punched in the face, it's, it's not the fact that the fist is heavy. It's, it's the fact that it's, it's moving, you know, quickly. That, that's the issue. Um, if you have a, a one kilo uh, plate and you lean it against glass, if you have a 20 kilo plate and you lean it against some glass, it doesn't make much difference. But if you have got to launch those things from the other side of the room, it's the one kilo plate that you're scared of because the 20 kilo plate's probably not going to make it there. Um, so we have to, yeah, if we can start looking at things through the lens of tension, then we have a better understanding of, oh, okay, that's why sprinters can do Nordics even when they haven't trained them in the gym. It's because they're practicing that movement under extreme tension every time they get out there on the track. Now, the magic of ATG is being able to then go from completely debilitated or in pain and following a logical sequence to get from wherever you are to that that high point again. If you're already at that high point, then you know power to you. And if you're already running ten flat, then you know that's all good. If you're throwing down windmill dunks, you probably can get fractional gains, um, especially by increasing the other side. You know that seems to give fractional gains. But um, yeah, it's when things go wrong that we really need that like short to long, and and where just doing more of the movement pattern isn't the answer. Um, like it's it's good until it's not is is kind of the the thing with like specific training. So it almost sounds like you're taking the stimulus that would occur when you're doing sports, or you know you're doing you know like you, you give the example of the guy roughhousing with his older brothers, and that's how his strength training mm -hmm. is. And you know these these sprinters who can you know bolt super super fast, and they're getting insane amounts of tension stimulus on their hamstrings, and that builds hamstring strength. You're basically you're looking at how that what that stimulus is and then trying to replicate it in a way that anyone could access because not everyone can just pick up and sprint right like a lot of people tear the hamstring right off their bone if they if they just try to break it into a sprint and they can't have that level of stimulus so you're looking for progressive ways to sort of rebuild that capacity and to create that uh, create a similar stimulus that you would you would have in maybe an athletic context in a way that's accessible to people does that kind of sum it up a little bit yeah, exactly. I think you, you know that like just doing hamstring curls isn't going to prepare you. If you just go into a hamstring curl machine, like seated hamstring curls or standing hamstring curls, where you have an emphasis on like the short range or the mid range position, then you, you know, you, you could be just as vulnerable when you go out and sprint. Whereas if we can work on that really long range position and we can make the strength training more tendon and more connective tissue dominant, then we really are preparing for that moment where the leg is almost straight and there is extreme uh, tension there. And people will say uh, it's only a, you know, it's, it's purely an isometric contraction. There's no concentric or whatever. You know, they talk about, you know, needing Nordic curls um, only to be, you know, we only test the eccentric. Um, kind of missing the point of that, that position, the connective tissues need to be super tolerant to tension. They're going to tolerate more tension if you've done extreme range RDLs and, you know, loaded slant board Jeffersons. If, if you've tolerated a lot of tension, like where it's like things want to ping, um, you know, where you're using a significant amount of weight 
I don't know how long you've been following Ben, but like maybe two years ago, he was doing these like drop catch RDLs. So he basically dropped the weight from hip height and catch it with the weight was just off the floor with a flat back and popping back up. It wouldn't be still on his socials or anything because he takes all his stuff down. But um, I always remember watching them and going like, that is the highest level of hamstring fu function that I've ever seen. And then it's, it's no surprise that he's able to do those, those kind of Nordics. It's no surprise that he's able to run 40 yard dash um, together with you know running backs and wide receivers and, and not be at the front of the pack but not being at the back of the pack um, that it's it's the way that you can get to that thing without being the kid who's naturally got it all like so you, you can you can build up that tolerance towards it but you can't by just listening to this podcast and then jumping into okay I'm going to drop catch RDLs you know, then you're going to be messaging me like, oh, I've got hamstring tendonitis. Oh, I tore my hamstring. You know, what should I do now? Like you have to, you have to give the, you have to understand the whole, the whole system. It's all, you know, it comes also back to your nutrition. It comes back to like recovery cycles. It's going to take a lot longer to recover from those kind of long range exercises as well. If you do like super maximal Nordics, like Nordics are almost always super maximal for people, right? Like they're above the maximum weight that you can handle. If you can't just like smoothly go in and out of any position, then it's above your maximum weight. So if you do above maximum squats and, and someone's like kind of helping a bit so you can like keep the bar on your back for a bunch of reps with more than your one RM, like think about how much risk there is there and think about how much DOMS you're going to get. Like, so people do that with the Nordics and then you know, wonder why the hamstrings are really sore or if you do them like three, four, five times a week and then you go on sprint, those tissues are being hacked up. Like that, that stuff is going to cause serious remodeling. So the, the trick is to like really understand the tools once you get to a point where you can bang out, you know, 10 cheetah reps like cheetah can, then it's not such a big deal. You, he can do them on game week and he can do them, you know, whenever he wants because it's like 60% of max for him. But <laughs> for everybody else, it's 120% of max. And if you're going to do them two days before you sprint, then, you know, I, I'm not going to be held responsible for that. So <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, what, <laughs> I, my goal is just to have people understand the frameworks so you can apply it logically because you, there is no, you can't really lay this stuff out well on paper of like, okay, this is exactly how many Nordics you need to do and this is when you need to do them. But when you understand these these concepts, then you know you, you can track someone's journey along and, and know how to customize it for like 20 different athletes all in the gym at the same time. Um, and athletes can understand these concepts as well. Like I've got these concepts across to, you know, the Australian, some of the Australian sevens rugby guys came and trained with me before the Olympics. And, you know, we were, oh, we were talking about these concepts and they went back and they explained them to their coach and, and to the coach's credit, like they started to, to do more of the stuff and, and he wanted to understand it as well. And you know, he's taken it to other rugby teams. And, um, yeah, I just, I just think like, I wish I had this stuff through the first 20 years of, of my coaching. And I'm, I'm just glad that I, um, or at least that's an athlete, but you know, I'm glad that I have it now and I just want, you know, coaches to be able to kind of understand and apply it. Um, yeah, in terms of, yeah, the details and the minutiae, I guess is not something that I'm going to be able to nut out. You need to be much smarter than me to try to calculate. Like it's very difficult, right? If you get to like volumes of tension and stuff and eccentrics and there's all sorts of physics going on there where it's like, it's going to take some machines a bunch of time to really um, put the stuff into algorithms and, and work it out. Um, and our, our current understanding of strength training is really like, I think we're kind of in the dark ages. Like it's, it's, um, I think we're just getting started with understanding a lot of these things and, um, yeah, we, we still have a lot to learn and that's, that's the fun of it. Um, it's a bit like the, yeah, the wild west or, you know, if we were building bridges and building skyscrapers, they would be falling down left, right and center. Like yeah, it, would be, it would be, it would be a dangerous place to live. Like the way strength and conditioning is versus um, say engineering, for example, you know, we've been building aqueducts and things for thousands of years and, and we kind of know like, yeah, these structures stay up and this works um, where strength training has come from bodybuilding and powerlifting and, you know, strength, the strength sports, you know, the weightlifting and all that sort of stuff um, where we need to come at it from another angle. And yeah, Edo's done amazing stuff and FRC's done amazing stuff. And then there's so many you know, great, ideas and systems out there um, to me the thing that has made the most sense is kind of that evolution of the of the polyquin system uh, in terms of preventing injuries and um, understanding how to get someone back to a high level of function like that's what's made 
the most sense and, and, and given the most results um, from my experiences so far. Um, and to me, like the West Side system has been like the, the one that understands physics the most um, in terms of like using banded reps and like heavy partials and, and all that kind of stuff is like how you put the most load um, into the body. <clears throat> so I still think the best is yet to come with people like combining these things and, you know, Ito's stuff is great, but not everybody has the patience for it, but people should be able to do something with their bodies, you know, not just be able to, you know, sit on a machine or move a, a dumbbell or a barbell from, from A to B. Um, yeah, I mean, CrossFit's done so much great for the world as well. It's, it's, there's just going to be a whole nother generation. If it's, you know, we're talking about web 3.0, like I, I did actually write a bunch of blogs about strength 3.0 being like, we, we had this time where, <clears throat> um, it was about kind of like circus performance and, and those sorts of things. And then we went into, you know, bodybuilding and powerlifting and those sorts of things. And now we're like figuring out a system that, um, is actually designed for the sort of human movement and human optimization. And yeah, like Ido has definitely had an amazing um, go at that and contribution to that. I think his goal was for if you wanted to train, you know, four to six hours a day, like this is what you do and you get to be able to do so much phenomenal stuff that um, most people will never get to experience. And then ATG is like, you know, if you want to put 20, 30 minutes in four or five days a week, then you can also be able to sprint and, and um, jump and, and have a body that works well. So um, I'm excited to see how all this stuff comes together. I think Ben's super open to having like different protocols and specializations and things. And within the ATG for coaches community, there are coaches who specialize in all sorts of things. You know, there's range guys and there's baseball guys and, you know, like throwing guys and quarter, you know, quarterback coaches and um, people in handball. And, and I, I think the iterations and the things that come up in the next few years are going to be very exciting. Um, there's a guy in Bali, the motion concept. He's probably the guy, he, he worked for me for a little while with real movement. And like I was, it was when I was just understanding all this stuff and, and dense strength and that stuff. And he put it into a program. And it, to me, it's like some of the best programming that, uh, that's been put together. And he, he can do, um, you know, he can do one arm chins for reps and, and 90 degree handstand push ups and still snatching like 90, 100 kilos. He's only like 70, 70 kilos. So, like, he's one of the best all round athletes, but he's using a lot of this long and short range stuff and pulses. And, like, he's putting it to use better than I ever can. And it is the ATG philosophy of, and it's been my philosophy of, like, be a product of your product. But over the last couple of years, like, with moving around and stuff like I'm, I'm not the best example of, of my product and you know, I just have to wear that. But some of these other guys are, are really putting this stuff to use and getting results that were, you know, no one was getting results like, um, you know, motion concept like Nico is getting at the moment or what Ben is getting or, you know, Lucas as well with range of strength. Like, um, yeah, these concepts really do play out to results that you just didn't see before. Yeah, that's that's great stuff. Um, what about uh, have you gone into WEC method or GOTA or you know functional patterns? Have you looked at any of those systems before? Because basically, I went from CrossFit. Um, I was able to lift a lot of weight. I was doing Nordics uh, all every day. I was doing Nordics, right? Because I had the machine before anyone else. You you do single uh, leg Nordics. I, yeah, I could do single leg Nordics back in the day, right? So I was really strong for my size. Uh, you know, squatting nearly 500, I'm 170, right? So I was doing ridiculous numbers, but I mean, very specialized into CrossFit, right? Um, I got rid of that completely. Um, now that I look at ATG, I probably would have bridged a little bit more and kept the strength training, but I got out of it completely, went into dance, from dance, functional patterns. Um, and when I dive into something, I really dive into it, WEC method, and then finally, now I'm in Gota and I kind of mix a little bit of everything. I'm trying to find personally where ATG really fits in. I'm wondering uh, how much do you apply, let's say, Spinal Engine? Are you a fan of Serge Greg Kepsky's work? Or let's say when you're doing a, a split squat, are you worried about what part of the foot you're on? 
it does that apply there or is it more tension based and we'll figure that out afterwards yeah there's a, there's a few things there Wait, do you have a, a, a like what's your background before that like do you have a background with sprinting or uh, what sports were you into well uh boxing i still do boxing yeah. i don't compete anymore or anything like that but yeah. I'm, I'm pretty high level at it skiing yep. uh very high level uh you know, sprinting in the past, I used to play soccer. Nothing at a yep. professional level, but everything pretty much close to that, you know? Like, so yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm an all-around type of person, I guess you can say. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, because not a lot of CrossFitters have the Nordics um, super strong. If you've got the soccer background and you just, you got the bench and you train super hard, it sounds like you're a guy that once you've got an idea on something, you work really hard at it. Um, that, that makes sense. Um yeah, I mean, work the functional patterns, um, go to, I think I, I, I'm really fascinated by it all. Like I definitely have spent a bunch of hours checking out all of it. Um, there are guys in our community who've done it. So I, I, we always have conversations about whatever else people are trying and where it kind of overlaps and, and that kind of thing. Um, for sure, biomechanics are, are super important. Like, you there's there's like a buy-in level where if the biomechanics are off by too much then you can't do the thing or you're definitely going to get injured and then there's like the optimal biomechanics um you know that will be the, the absolute best for that body which is like kind of gray or, or like a holy grail but you can't really know when you hit it um mm, the poliquin method and, and i guess west side as well is like if you can produce a lot more force than somebody else, then it doesn't matter that much. Like they can do it as pretty as they want to do it. We'll just do it faster and further and harder and heavier. Um, and so we'll be the winners. Like that's how most sports kind of work. And that's where my background has been. It's, it's my life has been about winning. It's been about being you know, the fastest, the heaviest, whatever. Um, so that stuff hasn't appealed as much just because um, I'm kind of wired that way. But it, it is really fascinating. Um, in saying that, like I've spent a shitload of time like juggling and and doing stuff like hand balancing, which is not at all like the, the fastest, heaviest, um, but then it's like pure skill or pure mind game um, where like that other, you know, those, those things seem to sit in the middle. They're not like not pure force. Um, but they're not sort of pure skill and they're kind of this, this uh, middle ground. And yeah, it, it does make sense to, you know, to do some of it. Um, if I had to bet my, my future on it, which, the, you know, that's the situation when you work in a professional sport, like you either win or, or you find a new job. Um, you know, I, the, I would stick with the approaches that, that I have used as the, the dominant approach, but, I would always bring in different people from different backgrounds to to challenge me and challenge the players and it's important to keep things fresh and, and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, so yeah, I don't really have anything like, I haven't done enough of any of those systems to understand specifically. Like the GOTA stuff is probably the most interesting to me out of those three systems in terms of um, like foot posture is, is something that like, um, is, is really, really important and probably not that commonly addressed. Um, it's not something that we coach a ton in ATG. Uh, I just, it just wasn't really on my radar. I wore minimalist shoes and just kind of thought everything would be okay, but it wasn't really. Um, and yeah, like I, I do think we need to understand more about where the foot needs to be positioned. And then once it's positioned in that way, then I, I think a lot of the, ATG movements will have a, a great, you know, outcome. But if you have the foot positioned poorly or it's not active, then I would f for sure say that you're going to have um, suboptimal results. And, you know, it's, it is an area that I, I think we can do better on. Um, I've been studying with uh, Graham Tuttle, who's just, you know, he can sprint bare feet. As I said, was saying before, he's got this return to run program. So I've been doing that with him. Um, it's, more like I think it's more like foot collective or I, I don't really know exactly where he's sort of like where he's been studying it from but it's like a lot of like smaller drills for the feet and um, <clears throat> manipulation of the foot and and then it goes up the body sort of incorporating some of the ATG stuff in that as well um, <clears throat> so 
yeah, I mean, as a coach, like it's it's just great to experience and test things. And you know, you've got that experience of okay, what does it feel like? You feel amazing when you're doing this stuff, but yeah, maybe maybe you do feel like you're missing a little bit of horsepower that you might have had before, or like muscle mass or whatever, and, and you might want to go back to it, or you might not. Um, you know, these are for each individual to work out, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't miss the horsepower because I feel like I have more now. Like I, my body's capacity is much more an actual movement where before I was, you know, just doing the heavy, my life was basically dedicated to going heavy at the gym and then, you know, everything else was quiet. It was recovery time. Right. So yeah, I'm just trying to bridge the gap there and see where, where you're at. What about spinal engine? Have you guys looked into that? Because that just me, before before like, we go absolutely. into that, I do I, yeah. I just want to make a quick point too, because you know, you you jumped, like you said, there there wasn't that bridge there between lifting super, super heavy and then going into movement and trying to because you know, we, we've talked a lot about that elasticity of of fascia and the reason that you feel like you have that explosivity in that freedom of movement is because you've conditioned that elasticity and that efficiency of movement. Um and, and you know one of the, one of the things that I noticed about ATG when I was doing it anyways is how springy I felt right and like I'm you know I'm doing some go to stuff and I'm a lot of go to stuff now a lot of movement stuff um, but I'm still doing a lot of the ATG work I'm still doing the split squats I'm keeping my inside ankle bone high when I'm doing ATG split squats now uh, you know a lot of the go to drop ins those things are related to a lot of the you know the short range work that we were talking about you're doing tons and tons of reps in this spiral movement to kind of condition and, and teach that movement. If you don't have the range in the hips, you're going to have to do some end range stuff so that you can access that part of the hip to do the drop in, right? There's, 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 I think ATG isn't just like a set of movements that you do necessarily. It's a set of training principles that can apply to different movement systems as well. Like, obviously you want to, you know, like, I think, if you're if you're doing like a specific program from Ben, you're going to do the ATG split squats and the Patrick steps. You're going to be doing the backwards walking and do all of that stuff. But the you know, like you said, training is kind of in the dark ages, right? We're like we're we're learning from each other and we're trying to figure out how to build different things, right? So so I'm I one of the things that I was really fascinated by in this conversation is I know that the tissue training principles of ATG that I've learned from you have been some of the most influential and most results producing. I've also talked to Will, you know, for 20 other episodes about biomechanics basically. So I wanted to see, okay, like we, we, we have these biomechanical principles that we want to work on. How can we apply these tissue training principles? And, and, and I do think, you know, again, you've talked about the reason that you were strong as shit in these movements, Will, but didn't have the power and the efficiency that you have now is because you were binding you know, that, that fascial smart suit in with these compound movements as much as you did. And that was one thing I found, you know, my, my experience with ATG is all that limitation that I felt from lifting in general, I got rid of with ATG, but I still felt that, you know, that horsepower that you're talking about. I felt strength and length and springiness. Um, I think adding in that elasticity training and some of those biomechanical principles are super important too. Um, but, and I'm sorry to interrupt. I just, I just had to throw that in there to, to be no like, problem. cool. I know, I know you have more efficiency and power now, but what if you had tried ATG as the bridge beforehand? Would you still have that same experience as like, would make, could, could you have both? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm still convinced that you, you know, there, there's, there's still some room for ATG principles within your movement methodologies that, that could be yield some interesting results. It's a great point, and uh, I have no doubt from looking at HEG and, and watching your stuff that I, if I saw it two years ago, I would have been in a way better place. You know, like I way overtrained in CrossFit, not knowing, you know, even having the short range versus long range in my head as I was doing it would have saved me a lot of energy. So I, I don't doubt that, right? It's just uh, I've kind of went on a different path with biomechanics, and I'm exploring. And that's what you do as a coach. You explore and uh, – yeah you know, use your body as a, a tool so that you can teach other people, right? So right now I'm going into biomechanics and, uh, you know, go to WEC method and I found a lot of success there. So that's what I'm experimenting now. And I was uh, talking more about the spinal engine. Have you looked at this quite a bit, like Sir Greg Kepsky's work and tried to integrate it into ATG at all or... Is that something? See, one of the one of the coaches did a presentation on it for us. We we have coaches like present, and I, there may have even been one on the coder stuff as well. But 
the, the guy who did the web, the, the spinal engine has, has done go to courses. Um, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, he, he presented around that and it makes a ton of sense. And I see that the best athletes do it. Um, they, none of them have actually been trained in that method, but they, but they do it. You know what I mean? Um, so there's, there's something sort of like, okay, like if the best athletes do it, then can we train them to do it? Or is there a reason why they do it and the other guys aren't doing it? Um, I, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's an interesting question The for sure the spine plays a key role. And I, I think like Ido, you know, put a huge emphasis on, on the spine and the health of the spine and being able to move it in all different directions. Um, yeah, my, my experience is, more that if you if you give the body the possibilities to use it, then it'll it'll work things out a lot more. And like sprint mechanics is is a, is a good example. Like sprint mechanics tend to improve a lot as you just put the muscles in the right places. Like if you strengthen the hip flexors, um, then you tend to be able to get more knee lift. If you take some of the tension out of you know the the whole posterior fascial thing, then you'll be able to get more knee lift and you get into better positions. If you strengthen the hamstrings, then you know the the stride will improve. Like if the pieces aren't there, if the physics are not there, like you can't get into the positions or you're not strong in the positions, then there's no chance that it's going to look good. Um, you know, where a lot of sprint coaches will teach you over and over, like get in this position, get in this position, like stay low off the start. It's like the kid's not strong enough. Like they cannot hold that posture. They can't produce enough force in that position. So, you know, what are you even talking about? Like that's, that's generally how I'll come at it. Like, and most people are so tight and dysfunctional and weak in key areas that is like so much massive panel beating to do. And I, I see that kind of work that you're talking about more as being like the, like a polishing um, kind of thing. And, you know, with your own experience, it makes sense that you've come from the background of like being able to produce extreme amounts of force. And then you go and like do something that's like makes everything feel nice and smooth. Like, and, and you, you become a phenomenal athlete. Whereas if you took yourself, you took a weak athlete and an underperforming athlete and you put them through that same polishing system, then maybe they, then maybe they still come last. Like maybe, maybe they don't, but maybe, maybe they do. Um, it depends on the, the, the size of the objects you, you know, you're playing against or how important physics are to the sport. Like, the less important physics are, then, you know, the more you can, you know, to, for dance or something, like it's very different, you know, to like the, it would make sense that ATG wouldn't be the best system for a dancer, you know, FRC or, or some of these other approaches might much better for a dancer. But if you have to get a shot put from a certain position to another position, or if you have to run over the top of another guy, um, you know, I dare say that you, you would have thrown a shot put further or, um, you know, being faster over five meters, um, even if your mechanics were a little bit off, but if your back squat was like 50 kilos heavier, then I would have still probably backed you. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, um, yeah, this is, this is the common, this is, this is not one or the other. So it's like, how much improvement in performance do you get from cleaning up the biomechanics? How much improvement do you get from improving the physics? Like it's, and, and that's a debate that you can have of like, yeah. you know, if you get a six-year-old girl and you train the, the the mechanics to be phenomenal, but she goes and races against a ten-year-old girl, you can train her in any system you like. I'll I'll take the ten-year-old girl and, and and she'll kick your butt. You know, so it's it's the same for my athletes that I worked with. It's like I just want my guys to be like the you know the the eighteen-year-old kids playing against the the fourteen-year-old kids, and and we don't have to like it's over at that point. Like we don't have to be that good at anything if if we just far physically superior and that's what opposition players were saying that they come off the field and they'd be like what the fuck do you guys do because you just you're just so much you know so much dominant over us like the team set the all-time defensive scoreline um, record like holding teams to zero won the regular season run won the grand final won the club challenge like and we weren't even predicted to, to make the finals and we didn't have atg stuff but we did we did uh you know, a hybrid kind of version of like, you know, Pollock and West Side stuff and, and other teams weren't doing it. And it was just that physics approach. So I guess I'm probably always going to be biased to that because it literally like made my career and broke all time records. And, you know, um, it's what worked. Um, so that, yeah, it's challenging to stay open to like, okay, well, but what are you missing? Like, and I can see the biggest thing that I was missing was guys had chronic stuff that I didn't know how to fix. Um, and, and so, if I was working with players now and the ATG stuff wasn't fixing chronic stuff, 
um, that I wanted to fix. Like it wasn't my role to do that because there was like a, there's a physical guy, there's a physiotherapist, like there's a bunch of different staff, and it wasn't my role. But I could see that things weren't getting fixed, and I would just send them off to those guys and just march away with what I could in in, in my program and and like adapt things. But I wasn't great at it, you know. Where now I'd, I'd like to be a lot, a lot better. Um, yeah, chances are I still have more learning to do with those things, but um, yeah, I think that's like that's my approach on like the big rocks. And, and I'm, I was the strength coach, like I wasn't. You you are the rehab guy, you know. So we like, <laughs> um, it is a different role as well. So I come at it from a bit of a different place. For yeah. sure, and that's. And I think in, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think it's population specific as well, right? Like if you're working with athletes, yeah, you do have to put on that mass and and all that, but. Uh, yeah, again, my where I'm at right now was efficiency. I'm getting older. I'm 38. I want to be able to be a ninja when I'm 80. That, that's always what I say, right? So that's more along the lines. I don't need absolute force. That last 20% that I could get before, I think I could put that away and, you know, be more biomechanically efficient so that I don't get injured. That's kind of where I come from. And I see the difference between being an athlete who has to hit somebody at five meters, yeah, you need to be massive. You need to put on mass. You need to be strong. Um, yeah, I, I get all that. Sorry, Anthony, what were you going to say? I was just going to say we we and like that debate of like you know what's going to have more impact, the biomechanical side or the you know the force production side. I mean, we spent twenty episodes like discussing that. <laughs> you know, like that's, yeah, that's like the be, art of move. The art of move is basically that discussion, right? We're yeah. we're we're exploring these different concepts, and I think uh, you know. Keegan, to your point, it's not one or the other. It's just figuring out where they fit into each other. And I really appreciate you coming on and having this conversation with us today. Um, episode 21 of the Art of Move podcast. Um, you're, you're really helping us kind of put even more pieces together. I hope we have another conversation super soon. I'd also love to talk to you personally on, uh, on another stream about some of the work that you're doing with your other business, Uncommon Success, some of the work into cryptocurrency and NFTs that you're getting into. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been an awesome episode. Um, for people who want to learn more about Keegan's work, you can follow on Instagram at ATG Mentor. Uh, you also have your Uncommon Success platform, um, which what's the Instagram for that if people want to kind of check that out? It's uh, Uncommon underscore Success. Cool. And anywhere else that people can check you, any, anywhere else that you would like people to see your work? My YouTube channel for ATG is, is probably like the stuff that I'm most proud of. <clears throat> There's some lectures there that kind of lay this stuff out and I've had some good feedback on them. So if you want to really explore the concepts, like Instagram is a difficult platform to really educate on because it's like everything comes and goes and it's a bit messed up all over the place. So that that's probably a good place if you're wanting to dive further into these ideas of like short and long range and tension and, and, and these concepts, uh, it's at the ATG Mentor on uh, YouTube, but you'll find it easy enough. Yeah, and and for anyone who's on the fence about that, I've been watched every one of those lectures, and they're all worth watching. So go check those out. Uh, Will, any closing thoughts? Any closing questions before we wrap it up today? Uh, no, I'd just like to thank Keegan for coming on. That was phenomenal information, and uh, we'd love to have you back for round two and in the future. Thank you. Yeah, and. As uh, you know, for the last episode of 2021, for the people who are on here live today, thank you so much. If you had a question, now would be the time to pop it in. We record these episodes live on No Filter Network, an interactive live streaming platform with zero delay to you know, an infinite amount of people, basically. Uh, if you want to see the upcoming episodes, we're going to be starting up again in 2022 in January when I'm uh, uh, you know, a little more recovered up from my shoulder surgery happening in a couple of days. But uh, Again, Keegan, thanks so much for jumping on here. Um, hopefully we'll have you on again in the new year. And to anyone who is listening or has listened to these podcasts, thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's, it, it, you know, it continually blows my mind that people are willing to just sit and listen to us talk for hours. So uh, thanks, guys. We'll see you next year. Thank you.